one of the basic mental faculties is called introspection. This long word comes from Latin words that mean to look inside. And one of the basic capacities that we have is to observe some of the things that are going on in us. So we can think about what we see, what we observe in the outside reality. We can think about whether we are hungry, whether we need something. We can think a little bit about our thoughts and our emotions. And for some time this was considered to be the whole of psychology as a science and as a part of our life. During the 19th century, there were several philosophers and poets, mostly inside what is called German Romantic movement, who wrote about something being present in us, something going on in the dark depths of our personalities that our introspection cannot reach. By the end of the 19th century, psychoanalysis was founded as a therapeutic and scientific movement which is completely focused on dealing with the unconscious. The unconscious was discovered in the work with patients. First, in Paris by Jean-Martin Charcot, who would show his colleagues that hysteric patients, when hypnotized, would not have symptoms anymore, and then after hypnosis, the symptoms would be back. And also, he would use patients under hypnosis to give them a certain command which they would follow after hypnosis. So people understood something was going on in the psychological world of patients beyond, or many would say below, the level of the consciousness. Much more famously, Sigmund Freud in Vienna developed the whole model of the mind based on the idea of the unconscious. He claimed that the conscious part of our personalities is much smaller and much less powerful than the unconscious part. What is really powerful in our personalities, Freud believed, was in the unconscious. And for most of the things we do in our everyday lives, most of our basic decisions, fundamental decisions in our lives, Freud believed were made in the unconscious so that we basically had no idea why we were choosing professions, spouses, friends, political convictions, and so on and so on. How is this possible? Freud believed that the unconscious was the place where the drives were. The drives were the basic motivation the human being has. And Freud spent a lot of time thinking what the drives could be. His basic conviction throughout his career was that the drives must be in conflict. He changed ideas about which these drives might be, but he always believed they were in conflict. And he thought the basic feature of our psychological life was this constant conflict that was going on inside of our unconscious. One level of this conflict, and for its final conception, was that the life drives were in battle against the death drives our tendencies to create, to make something new, to make something original, fresh, spontaneous, were battling against our tendencies to repeat, to repeat beyond the capacity to introduce anything new. Another level of unconscious conflict was the one between the prohibitions and desire. And this is one of the most famous parts of Freud's theory, especially when it came to sexuality. In the Victorian times, in the 19th century Vienna, when prohibitions were many and very important, Freud developed a theory in which he claimed we all wished for so much and could express so little. And the prohibitions did not come from the society alone, but they also came from the defense mechanisms and censorship we have inside of our personalities. So in the unconscious, we might wish for sexual gratification or the expression of our aggression or to owning everything in the world and many different things. But there are prohibitions in our personality which do not allow us to fulfill any of these wishes. We see the unconscious through the consequences of these conflicts. So 
censorship and defense mechanisms would try to keep the unconscious wishes completely out of consciousness. But then, when we fall asleep, the censorship in Freud's opinion falls asleep as well. So we dream some of the wishes are represented in an unusual form. Another point, people may have symptoms which we associate with mental disorders, but these symptoms also have a meaning, and this meaning is, by a rule, connected to the unconscious. In their daydreaming, in children's play, we also can see some manifestations of the unconscious. We do or say or draw things we did not intend that turn out to have a very deep meaning and connection with something that had happened. Freud hypothesized that there were three parts of our personality. The most fundamental one, which he called the id, is the part where our drives, our bi biological roots are, and many of the things we don't want to see, we put in this space and then forget that they exist. Then the next part is called the ego, and that is the part which contains what we most know about. Perception, reality testing, thinking, identity to a certain level, defense mechanisms and so on. Finally, the superego, the part which is connected with feelings of guilt, duty, obedience, decency and so on and so on, is completely unconscious. So most of our personality, structurally speaking, is unconscious. In contemporary psychoanalysis, understanding of the unconscious gets changed significantly. It is not seen as dark, so to say, as it was in Freud's days. Creativity is considered to be there, and some of the very positive sides of human personality may be there as well. One important contemporary conception of unconscious is that it is an unformulated experience. What happened to you, but you have not elaborated, you have not reflected upon, will remain unconscious. So in this conception, unconscious is not a space, it's not a storage for what you didn't want to face or for your drives or anything. It is just experience that for some reason you did not dare or you were not focused enough to think about and to talk about. Quite different than Freudian conception, but it seems to be quite useful clinically.